Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Middleton Place Foundation's Plugged Into History programming. It is Thursday, and that means Hands on History Thursday. And today we have a special treat for you. Uh, Mary Edna Sullivan, curator of the Middleton Place Foundation, is here with us today. And she has some extant garments, both up here and downstairs, that we're going to talk about. Now, Everybody, I want you to know that we had best laid plans today and all of these garments were downstairs and the two um, sets of clothes that we see here upstairs were once located right below the portraits of the gentleman who owned them. Um, but when we arrived at Middleton Place this morning, we found the power to be out and the power remains out. So we are using the power of the sunlight that we have here in the summer bedroom to share these garments with you. They really are stunning. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the comparison of the images along with the textiles. So um, you'll have to come back and see us another day to see those images again if you weren't with us earlier um, in the weeks ago that we were uh, showing those portraits. But in the meantime, these extant garments are not on regular display here at Middleton Place. So this is really a special treat for you. Mary Edna has gone out of her way to pull out these textiles and really give us um, some interesting information on uh, what we've got here remaining. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Middleton Place Foundation has been in the business of telling American history for over 40 years. And uh, we're really fortunate to have experts here like Mary Edna and Nicole is standing by our seamstress from earlier in the week um, to help out. And so we're really appreciative of, of you all helping us continue the stories here. So without further ado, I see all of you chiming in and saying good morning. Thank you all for joining us. Make sure you drop your questions in the comments section and Mary Edna will um, answer them as we get them. And so without further ado, Mary Edna, take it away. Hey, good morning everyone. Welcome to Middleton Place House Museum. It's an honor to be able to show you this very, very special collection. The clothing I'm showing you today dates from the 1770s through the 1850s, and all were worn and owned by members of the Middleton family. They were found in 1932 under a stack of hay in a barn that was being demolished, and the leather trunk was lined with cedar, so everything came out in very good condition, which is a rare, rare event here in the South with the weather and the insect population. This lovely gold waistcoat and breeches that I'm standing behind, this was worn by Henry Middleton. He was the first Middleton at Middleton Place. He married a charming woman named Mary Williams, and this place was her dowry. This was probably made somewhere around 1770, the fabric is from 1764, which is not unusual. And the style is a little old fashioned for 1770, not much, but slightly. The waistcoat's a little bit longer than was fashionable and the neckline's a little bit higher. Now this is a all silk gold brocade costume. Uh, I've done some things. You can see the buttons, which have, these are the original buttons which you can see have damaged, was perfect. And over here we have, if you're interested in the back as well as the front of clothing, this is the reverse, this is the buckram. This is some conservation work I did with stable text because the pure silk lining is, was rotting away and I was trying to keep any more of it from rotting away. Now over here, close to me, I have, you know, there's these wonderful pocket flaps, but as you can see, the fabric you see most of the time in here under the pocket flap is what the original fabric would have looked like. So that coral color in particular really pops out there as you lift up that pocket flap. Correct. It's just the brown. I mean, you, you think the brown, but if you look carefully, you don't even see the coral in some of the, the pieces. And I believe uh, before the Middleton Place Foundation was created in 1970s, uh, these were on loan by the family who found them, who were part of the Middleton family, to the Charleston Museum. And I think the fading that you see is a result of e exhibition and lighting. Hmm. And this is why today um, we keep them in an 18th century clothes press. 
<laughs> just appropriate. The design, you know what I mean? It's still in use because all this recent studies have shown that when you close the door and you don't open them, it creates a, a perfectly safe microclimate. Uh, for extra security, we put some camphor bars in there to make sure there are no bugs. And we have this kind of wrinkled up looking paper, and I'm sorry you can't touch it. We can't touch the silk either, <laughs> but this is as soft as the silk. This is a Japanese made paper called a baka. And uh, it's used in delicate silk textiles and whatever else is delicate. And it helps maintain roughly the shape and form while they're in storage so that there aren't creases and the fabric doesn't break. Great. Um, we do have a question already. Yay. Oh, a question. Okay. Yes. So um, Sarah would like to know, how long would it have taken to make this garment? Well, that would be interesting. Um, I honestly don't know exactly because it depends on how many seamstresses were working on it. Uh, but if you had several seamstresses, or in this case, since it's men's clothing, we usually say it was a tailor, uh, they could probably whip this up with, if it were a rush order back in the day, for an important client. If he'd come in at the beginning of the week and he had picked out his fabric, uh, or he brought his fabric with him, uh, they probably could have had it to him by the end of the week, yeah. at the very latest. I mean, they've been known to do some things overnight. This is a fairly, well, <laughs> by 18th century standards, it's a fairly simple piece of clothing. And even the breeches are fairly simple. I mean, there's some difficult work going on in uh, doing the waistband and getting the knees right. but. It's a relatively simple pattern. In fact, when I get to my next piece, we'll talk a little bit more about 18th century patterns. Great. Um, really quick, what's the name of that Japanese paper again? Abaka. It's A, B, might be two Bs. A, B, B, A, C, A. And uh, I used to have the, a catalog, but I haven't gotten one lately. So I'm any good conservation uh, house, resource house could probably find it for you if they didn't have it. Or a good Google search would probably get it for you. Sure. We'll, um, Heidi, we'll see if we can search that for you and drop a link here in the comments for that paper. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question before we move on. Do we think that that was made here in Charleston, or do we think it might have been made in Europe? I think Great this question. may have been made in England. Because one of the reasons what the uh, lighting, the power situation is done is this is probably one of the few pieces of clothing that exists in most museums today that actually goes with the portrait of the man wearing it. It's a very, very rare thing. And downstairs we have Henry Middleton's portrait by Benjamin West from about circa 1770, and he is wearing this waistcoat and breeches. Um, somebody, a couple of folks wanted to know, is this everyday wear for Henry? And um, I think you'll probably tell us a little bit about this next question later, but uh, how do you know the year that the fabric was created? So is this everyday wear and how do we know about the year? Well, the I think this is a special. I think most people wore plain, depending on whether you're here or in England, they would wear plain linens or woolens or even the pants would be uh, made of animal materials, depending on who you were and what you were doing. But this is a very elegant evening piece, and it's particularly elegant. I want to show you something. We call it a sign of conspicuous consumption. The back of this waistcoat is the same fabric as the front. And I will show you that his son's waistcoat does not have, he has the usual standard linen backing. So this is a very special outfit. And, and he may have had it made for his portrait. Yeah. I don't know that. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of records from the 18th century, and a lot of it is based on style and design. And the reason I know roughly what year it was made is back in the mid 18th century in England, some customs people confiscated an illegal French silk sample book uh, and in the book on a page that I can't come to, but I have it downstairs if you're really interested, uh, it's a book that has all these fabric samples and in a blue color, this fabric is there in the blue color. 
So a, a silk sample book from the mid-1700s yes. was confiscated and had the same pattern but on a blue field. And the original book, if I believe, is at the Victoria and Albert in London. Oh, cool. And, and there's a book published. It's, it's page for page, the book uh, called, I think it's called, I have it downstairs, it's a silk sample book. Yeah, we'll definitely show you all a picture of the cover of that book. So if Never there's any more questions about this, I can move on to the next piece. Yeah, that'd following. be great. Um, Pat wants to know, was men's clothing expandable for size and weight gain like women's? I'm sure it could be. This one doesn't have much of a seam like you would expect to find, but I think this was made for a special occasion. I don't think he planned to wear it uh, forever, but any of these, they're all hand sewn. The stitches are small hand with you know yellow silk or gold I should say gold silk and they um, can you pick that up again if the camera can see it there's it sure can. some gold stitching right there um, there you go so all of you hand sewers large <laughs> stitches in the hem and below that teeny weeny hand stitches Hi, Jenny. Thanks for watching. All right, so we're on to... Now, this is another set of waistcoat and breeches, and these belong to Arthur Middleton, Henry's son, oldest son, and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. The, the breeches are red silk velvet, and the vest is a brocaded blue and... Well, it's... We think Arthur liked roses. Almost all of his surviving waistcoats have roses. We have four of them. And this one are little rosebuds, and then the fabric is shot with silver. And then, unlike his daddy, he has a linen backing. I don't know if his budget was shorter or what, but he has linen. And then these, again, you can see where even the buttons show where the silver sequins tarnished and the fabric maintained itself because the coat flap covered it. So if y'all can see that this waistcoat is shiny, that's not a trick of the light and it's not wet. It has silver thread running through it. It's shiny. It's shiny. <laughs> and what's really nice uh, with the breeches, one of my colleagues, Mackenzie Schultz, uh, last year, yes, last year, <laughs> Uh, came and, and examined these red silk breeches and she made a pattern and the pattern comes with we sell it in the museum shop and in our online catalog yep we our online store is not live yet but it will be very very soon and you can purchase this pattern there or you can purchase it uh, in our museum shop once the museum shop reopens that's not yet um, for $20 and you get, the, you get all the pieces of the pattern. If you've ever done 18th century clothes, you know they're very complicated. And you get this wonderful total book that shows you pictures, identifies the stitches, gives you instructions how to use it. It's a fabulous book. It's well worth those of you who are sewing uh, fanatics, shall we say. <laughs> um, because those of you who are, are. <laughs> and you know who you are. Uh, I don't Look at you, Nicole. <laughs> I don't. I gave up sewing a long time ago, but I had a grandmother who was a magnificent seamstress, and she taught me a love of fabrics and clothing, and that is one of the things that nudged me into in loving costumes and textiles. And this is a red silk velvet, and um, many years ago, when I was curator at the Louisiana State Museum. In New Orleans, we had an altar cloth that we were thinking of conserving. It was the red, silk red velvet backdrop on the silver embroidery that was having problems. And we priced this red silk velvet. Only could find some in Italy. This is a long time ago. I do not have the resources. It was going to be between $800 and $1,000 a yard to buy Ooh. this red silk velvet. So Ooh. just for those of you Imagine who are interested... Like Couple and decades in your budget. Um, this is this is an expensive piece, and that is that piece is probably at least two, maybe two and a quarter yards um, that it would take to make those breeches. 
So we have some questions. Um, Heidi, I'm sorry to say that we do not have any patterns for women's clothing here from Middleton Place, but Mackenzie of Fig Leaf Patterns, and if we can show that front sure. of that pattern again. Mackenzie, if you oh, um, Google nice. Fig Leaf Patterns, she has tons of patterns. It is her gig to go around and find and study ah, extant think, historical clothing. I think, I think that's And her, that's lovely. Yeah, There's yeah. her information. Um, so you can absolutely Google or go to Fig Leaf Patterns, find her um, shop. Uh, and you can get, she does a variety of time periods as well. It's not just the 18th century. So please, please consult Fig Leaf Patterns and um, Mackenzie's work. She, you know, spends her life. Her job is to go around and look at extant museum pieces like this and draft patterns from them along with some other stuff. And we have um, a tentative appointment for her to come for something else. We haven't decided what, but something else will be done hey. in the near future. So people want to know how these clothes are cared for. How how do you how would one in the 18th century wash these garments? Well, you probably would dry clean them. Yeah. So you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now the shirts and the chemise. That's why they wore so many underclothing, which you may have watched uh, on another segment of this program. They wore a lot of underclothing, and it, it protected the clothing from the linen, and it was usually linen and these types. It would be your sweat and your body oils, they would be absorbed by the linen and you wouldn't damage the um, material. Now I do have, I didn't use it for this show, but his one of his frock coats that we have has all this white wine, well, I say it's white wine, it, it's got a stain and the destruction resembles what white wine does to silk. And, uh, but I thought that in limits of time and elegance that these are two of our better pieces of men's clothing and that's why I selected them. Sure. Um, a couple of people are asking about sizes, um, estimating Arthur's height and weight and then um, estimating the size of these breeches. And thank you Digital Middleton Place, thanks Sabrina for finding that Fig Leaf Patterns link so quickly. Uh, we appreciate that, it's there in the comments for you guys. Scroll down and find figleafpatterns.com. Um, and also, I wanted to mention that we sell this pattern in two sizes, so there are modern sizes of the pattern available, um, as we are about to talk about Arthur's See, teeny tiny size. See, this one is size. a 3242. And, and then she has one larger as well. So, um, yeah, so how do we estimate Arthur's height, size, weight? What size are these breeches? What are well, we... I don't know what his weight was exactly. Uh, that's difficult. But using a... A, for, a couple of formulas that are available via the archaeology world uh, and the fact that we have we I measured his leg for his femur and I measured his frock coat for the length of his humerus and using the equation that they give you <laughs> in this book and you can probably find it online uh, various sources not any one particular sources because I double checked several different sources to do this and I figured out he was five feet five and three quarter inches tall. Yay, that's exactly my height, but I could I never wear say, these. Which is about saying. as tall as Karen is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's my height too. Mm -hmm. And when I, um, I have mounted them one time for photography and I use a children's um, mannequin to mount them. Gotcha. So we don't really know necessarily in modern equivalents what the size would be. Maybe so Nicole can give us a guess. The, that waistband is unbuttoned and it has the ties in the back expanded. Um, but just based on my knowledge, I would tell you that that waistband is probably around 30 inches. Maybe not much bigger than that. I actually have it measured. I just don't have it in my head and I don't have it with me. So go. it's a relatively, you know, a relatively small stature. Um, as compared to, you know, men today. Sure. I have a 15-year-old that's way bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how many items were found in that trunk that you were talking about earlier? I don't on? usually keep count of things because <laughs> I have a problem with numbers. But there were at least, there's the Henry, there was, Arthur has about four outfits, not complete. He has like about four waistcoats, he's got a frock coat. And he's got the breeches in addition to what you're seeing here. Uh, there was uh, some baby clothing. There's some children's clothing, which we'll see later. 
and um, it, it's a small trunk. I mean, I think if I said no more than 30 pieces, I would be too many. Mm -hmm. But I'm one of those people, I my mind is too ephemeral to keep numbers in my head. <laughs> That's okay. Is there anything else about Arthur here, or shall we uh, head on downstairs? I think that would be about it for now. And I mean, I don't, you know, to, uh, we have a, a couple of examples of wedding gowns and uh, children's clothing. All right, well, let's head on downstairs. So we're gonna walk through the museum now, everybody. And we're gonna head on downstairs for more extant garments that uh, are in the collections here at Middleton Place. And while we're going, um, oh, I'm going to try and walk really slowly here. Oops. the front room um, and through that darkened threshold over there is where we were originally going to do all of this but you all can see the uh, light situation in there no lights on our portraits barely any light in the room so um, thanks so much for sticking with us here in our uh, <laughs> in our revamp of how we're going to do this so, yes you know so, um, do you have first that book? Here yes, it is. I so, Selling Silks, and this is that 1764 sample book um, that Mary Edna was referring to, and there is a very small um, example of Henry's fabric in there. Um, I'll do my best to zoom in on it. So you can see it's that same design, but on a blue field with gold flowers. So you can find this book um, and look at it yourself. I bought um, this at Williamsburg. There you go. So if you're looking for it, I'm sure the Victorian Albert may have it also. I don't know. Well, we're going to talk about a little bit about wedding gowns. And um, we'll start with 18th century wedding gowns. Uh, one of Arthur Middleton's sisters, Henry Middleton's daughter, Hester married our next door neighbor, practically, uh, Charles Drayton of Drayton Hall, which is just about three miles down the road, maybe five. And um, the family saved. We're not sure why it's a swatch versus more of the dress, but as I said, the South is not kind to fabrics, particularly if they're silk. And this is a woven silk brocade. And if I haven't mentioned it before, most of these silks are from Lyon, France, which was one of the major places doing brocaded fabrics in silk in the 18th, well, even the 17th and 16th century. Um, and all these flowers, a lot of people think that they're embroidered on uh, the ground, which is this sort of crimson red striped fabric. But if you look, you can see the, the thread where it has been pulled up and down and it's a weaving technique that the people in Lyons did to create brocades. And the dress itself, my guesstimate from the date of her wedding, which was 1774, might have looked something like this. This is from Janet Arnold's book for those of you who are familiar with her work, Patterns of Fashion. This is uh, one possibility for her dress. And then the next page. If you were watching us on Tuesday, that was the style of dress that Nicole was dressing me in, a robe à la française or a sack back gown. And um, then this is another example of the same era. The dress could have been made in a either of these styles. We just don't know, but uh, the family history tells us that this was not found in the trunk. This was a later donation by a descendant. And um, they have a very lovely little handwritten note that goes with it, and that this was part of Hester Drayton's. And the same family members also, I don't know if we can get a picture of it, but 
serendipitously right next door to it is her cookbook, which was carefully saved and is part of our archives collection. It's a real short jaunt from textiles mm. to cooking in archives. <laughs> One would not have been cooking in this textile, though. No. No, no. She would, she would be uh, the mistress of a household of enslaved people who would have, there would be probably two or three people who were cooks. I know Arthur Middleton even had one enslaved person, I think it was Patsy or Polly. I, my mind doesn't keep everything. I have senior moments. Mm -hmm. But um, he had one who was a pastry chef. So, you know, it was a different, you know, this would be for a special occasion. This is, and they may have cut it up and made it for her daughter at a later date. Who sure. knows? But this is what's left. And those are my surmises of what it might have been. Now remember, this is a very bright, colorful, gorgeous. I can only imagine what the dress might have looked like. Uh, it's a type of fabric that members of the court of Versailles would have been buying. Just for your information. <laughs> now this dress right here is a 19th century wedding dress, 1839. And this, according to the donor, who was one of her great greats, granddaughters, and she wore it in 1980, um, uh, that's Eliza Middleton Fisher, the, one of the younger daughters of Governor Henry Middleton and his wife Mary, and she is a sister. I'm going to go around to the other end of the table while you talk. Middleton. I'm going to get over here because I'm blind with the light. Mm -hmm. um, but this dress was worn by Eliza. We're missing possibly some organic some sleeves. Because you can see, like, this is not the wedding dress. This is a, what you might call her, well, it might be more than her first day dress because this was done when she got to Philadelphia to her new home. She was married here at Middleton Place in 1839. And it was a very simple affair because she was recovering from one of those many fevers that happened to people. We don't know exactly what fever it was. And then when she got married, she and her husband, Joshua, went up to Philadelphia where he was from. But they would present the new bride to the family, and uh, they would have special clothing for that event. But this is the wedding girl. It's just a very plain silk twill with, <laughs> as one friend told me the other day, she had made one of these, and the way these shoulders and the cap sleeves are cut, you cannot raise your arms. Ah. You have to, you, I mean, you're, you're very constrained in what you can do. There would have been a corset. There would have been what I call a slender, bell-shaped crinoline to support the skirt. And you can see it's a, it's not fully out because we have, this is a relatively new donation and we have only had it for about a couple months so I haven't finished studying it and doing any of the work that I usually do with these things. But I have it packed with the Ibaka paper mm -hmm. because silk needs the Ibaka paper. And um, this was put, 1980, it was worn, it looked gorgeous. I have pictures, but I just don't happen to have them today. And uh, they gave it to one of those heritage bridal places. And I don't know what they, I don't particularly care for these places because they don't seem to clean them properly and they don't pack them and store it. And the gowns come out of these boxes rotting away. And the other day, I don't, oh, it's dark here, but <laughs> this may be a 20th century wine stain. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Can you see the little brown? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to move the dress too much, but the armholes are very badly rotted, which means she didn't have, it wasn't properly cleaned. And she, of course, did not wear enough undergarments to protect the dress from body perspiration. In and, the 1980s. Pardon? In the 1980s. In the 1980s. I mean, the dress probably made it really well from the 1830s. So we have a question about when did white wedding dresses become popular? Because this is, uh, again, folks, we've moved from the 18th century, from the 1700s, into the 19th century. We're in the mid 1830s. This is 1839, and I think white became very popular. I mean, you could see small evidence of it beginning in the 19th century, but you really see it after Queen Victoria married Prince Albert. And with her white dress and her orange blossoms. In fact, this young woman had an orange blossom crown, which we have remnants of. Um, and it just isn't enough time to show everything, but she saved it. Cool. <laughs> and uh, one of her great great grandsons 
donated it to us many years ago. But you can see this is where it wears. You know, you can see staining. And again, that's probably the 20th century wedding, white wine, mm. getting on everything. But um, it's a beautiful piece, and I hope to get it stable enough to someday do a small wedding exhibition using this as the centerpiece. Great. We have one more quick question. Um, yes, Jenny, you were right, after Queen Victoria. <laughs> um, how much would these dresses cost? Now, we've been looking at a couple of different examples. Um, so I don't know if that question is in reference to the 18th century gowns or this 19th century gown. Um, but again, remember, folks, that uh, money changes value over time, too. So uh, it's a tough well, question. One, one thing you can be assured of is all these fabrics from Governor, from Henry Middleton's gold brocade to this simple silk twill were top of the line fabrics from probably some of the best textile manufacturing in the world. France, I mean, England with Spitalfields uh, was doing a lot, but these people, I, you know, I mean, we don't know where, we think it may have been made locally, or it may have been made in Boston, because there is a small storyline, which cannot be confirmed, that this was a gown worn by her older sister, Henrietta, when she got married in Boston, in Newport area in 1833, which would mean she predated Queen Victoria with her white gown. Ah, translator. And Henrietta and her husband, uh, Edward Pringle, died with their whole family, two young children, um, in an explosion of a steamer called the Pulaski when they're going from Charleston to Newport uh, in 1830. Sixes, I think, was the date. I'd have to double check that. So, when Eliza got married, apparently the orange blossoms, well, she wore the gown of her sister, maybe. Definitely, I know the orange blossoms that she wore in her hair, because there's a note in Eliza's own hand that said, These were my sister Henrietta's, and I and my cousins, she names a couple of other cousins, have worn them in her memory. So, they mm -hmm. apparently, these three other, Eliza and two of her sister cousins, got married after. Henrietta's death and uh, wore the orange blossoms in her memory. Great, thank you. Any questions? Did you uh, mention the yeah. Oh, well, one of the distinctive things here is, you know, there's, I don't know how many of you sew, but these are called cartridge pleats. And you can see how tightly packed. This is a lot of fabric. There's probably but I don't have it in my head. There's probably three or four yards of fabric in this skirt. And, um, and one other thing, I can pick it up slightly. And you can see the back, which has these nice points. And uh, it has the original hooks and eyes, which is how these would have closed before zippers and buttons. Mm -hmm. Books and eyes have been around for a very, very long time. Very long time. And one thing I found recently, and I, I didn't know it when, no matter what one reads, one always finds something else. Buttons were limited to be used only by the highest level of society when they were first introduced in medieval times or late early Renaissance. I forget the exact year. But they were included in sumptuary laws that restricted who could wear buttons. Mm. So what do we have over here? Well, last but not least, in the same trunk. Uh, now, this wedding gown wasn't in the trunk, nor was the, uh, the 18th century wedding gown. They were all uh, recent donations. Well, you know, work. Now, what we have here, these two outfits were in the trunk. And I have a quick picture of when I had them exhibited on small mounts at one time in what we call the children's room here in the House Museum. And it's, it's a beautiful, uh, and these are worsted. Uh, dress with wonderful, this is a, a black velvet, probably done with pinking shears, uh, rickrack that adorns each of the little pleats. And who do you think would have worn this dress and jacket? Does anybody have any ideas? 
I do, but I'm not allowed to answer. <laughs> Who do y'all think would have worn this worsted dress? That would be wool, right? Worsted yes. wool. And, and the jacket is and also. And jacket. The plaid jacket with the brown velvet trim and glass buttons. And it doesn't go all the way down. It opens and it's, you can see the beautiful stitching. So can we, um, yes, so that we can see a glass okay. button glimmer. Huh. Oh, there we go. Well, these uh, I'm guessing a little boy. Yes, it was just a little boy. There we go. There's a couple little boy. There we go. Good. It was absolutely. It was a little boy. His name was Henry Middleton. <laughs> which Henry Middleton? <laughs> he was the great great maybe great grandson of Henry Middleton. He was born in 1851. And um, he was the second child of Susan Smith, Susan Pringle Smith Middleton, who married Williams Middleton in 1849. He had an older sister. And for some reason, we don't have any of her clothes. But they did say, for some reason, and we don't know why. Now, these were all handmade. They were probably made here on the plantation. And I would not be surprised if the work was done by an enslaved seamstress. Now, I don't know the name. Back then, the nurses for these children were called Da, D-A-H. And uh, we do not have a record, or we have not found a record at this point that identifies her. But we do know that there was at least a woman named Rachel and another woman named Celia who were involved in sewing between the 1840s and the 1860s. We just don't know who did these, but it's hand sewn and you know, it's a very, it's, well this is, this is complicated and this of course is matching plaids and let's see which side has, for some reason, we don't know why, but there's a little gusset added to this to, um, and I'm not, you know, it just, I'm not sure why. <laughs> it's just there, maybe it didn't, they wanted that particular flare that you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, tartan was very popular with, again, shall we mention Queen Elizabeth and her passion for tartan? <laughs> but I'm not Queen Elizabeth, Queen, Queen Victoria. Victoria. Well, Queen Elizabeth likes it too when she goes up to Balmoral. But, um, but well, these are the two pieces that we have of children. We've got some other smaller pieces, but these are in the best shape and are the most visually able to be seen and enjoyed. Well, you bring up an interesting point because this is a demonstration of possibly enslaved women's work. Um, but I was going to ask you, and this seems like a good time, you know, we clearly in the collections here at Middleton Place don't have any extant clothing that was once worn by enslaved workers. And we did talk about that a little bit yesterday. Nicole mentioned it, that um, it's very rare to find extant garments and that we don't know of any off the top of our head from the 18th century, right, Nicole? Right. But that there uh, probably are some in collections around the world from the 19th. And so can we just, do you have ideas or can you reiterate about why that might be? Well, well, for first part, I mentioned I had been a curator somewhere else before, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in New Orleans. And we had a couple of madras, Indian madras, uh, scarves, handkerchiefs, whatever you would care to call them, that uh, were had a history. And in New Orleans, African American women called their head wraps pinyons. And this had his these two men, and I they were on exhibit when I left there, but that was over 20 years. I, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing now, but two mandras handkerchiefs that were pinyons, and why they survived or. What, but we also know that in looking at fabric purchased by uh, the men who were slave owners, they do buy these madras printed, you know, you know how madras plaids were popular in the 1950s? Well, it was popular back in the mid 18th, 19th century too. And uh, it wasn't quite as colorful as today's, but it's uh, a very interesting, it's the only outfit that I know of, even though I know several people have done a lot of research. Now we have in our collection, although we don't have, it's not necessarily a Middleton piece, but we have, which is now being exhibited at the Smithsonian Institution's African American Museum of History and Culture, uh, a sack. It is probably a cotton, linen, lit wind feed sack. 
done on a sewing machine. And in the 1840s, uh, a grandmother filled it with some clothing, some food, a lock of hair, and all her love for her granddaughter who was being sold off from a South Carolina plantation. And we know this because the great-great-great-granddaughter of this slave who was sold off uh, embroidered in the 1920, 1927 to be exact, embroidered her story and her grandmother's story and her great-grandmother's story on this linen. And we got it through serendipitously because the woman who did the embroidery was named Ruth Middleton. And now this is up in the first hall on the lowest level uh, of the um, Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Wonderful. So textiles, uh, sometimes clothing a little more difficult to find extant, a little bit harder to survive, but um, textiles aren't just clothes, everybody. So we do find okay. these stories in and other these, textiles. Well, I mean, think about it. I mean, over 300 years, we have four pieces. I'm showing you maybe four pieces, six pieces of clothing. I mean, that's, I mean, and that was the people who were the people who were owning the slaves and they had the big houses and the fine houses and the money to take everything. And yet, very little survives from them also. So, it, textiles are not survivors. Mm -hmm. because they rot from the way they were made, the dyeing and making process. And then, once they're made, the climate, fire, floods, hurricanes. Where? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, I was looking out the window. Sorry, hurricanes. <laughs> Um, if you could reiterate, and um, we just had a question, do we have other examples of children's clothing? We have a couple of 20th century christening gowns. But these things folks are in the best condition, which is why Marianne chose them. Yeah, these are the ones that um, are the oldest in a line of older things. They exhibit well, and they are in good enough condition for me to want to handle them enough to get them out. I mean, we have a lot of things that aren't in good enough condition that I even want to handle them, <laughs> let alone uh, exhibit them or display them even in a symposium like this. Yeah, y'all, this is, I, I want to reiterate how special it is that we are getting a chance to look at these garments, looking at them in natural light, um, that Mary Edna has taken the time and Nicole has taken the time to carefully unpack these things, bring them down, bring them up, move them around as our power outage dictates. Uh, we are so, so fortunate. These are not things that you get to see normally on exhibit when you come here to Middleton Place because they are so delicate. So we're just really fortunate today to get a chance to put these on screen for you and to have you join us digitally. Um, don't forget to drop your questions in the comments. Um, but we really appreciate you being here. As I mentioned in the beginning, Middleton Place Foundation has been in the business of preserving and interpreting American history for, gosh, over 40 years. And uh, we're so fortunate to have experts like Mary Edna and Nicole on staff here to help us understand the lives of the Middletons and of the enslaved workers, um, both through what they wear and through how they work. Um, and so we're just really grateful to be able to share this with you all. It's the mission of Middleton Place Foundation to um, not only share American history, but to allow those connections that we make with it to help us understand ourselves and each other better. So thank you for engaging with us because every time you join us for Plugged Into History, uh, you are helping us to forward our mission even more. So make sure you let us know if you have any other questions. We will forward them to the ladies if this uh, ends before we get a chance to see your comment pop up. Um, I'm pretty sure I have these ladies on speed dial at this point. So uh, we'll get your questions answered. Don't worry. And uh, Mary Edna and Nicole, thank you so, so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. All right. So we hope that you all will come out and see us the next time that you are able um, and see some of the other treasures in the house here and around the property. So, Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Don't forget to join us tomorrow, Friday afternoon, for Plugged Into History. It's History Unplugged at 5 p.m. You can start your weekend with us and some friends from around the country. We'll have guests from North Carolina, Virginia, and South Carolina 
And we're gonna have a little garden party in our recreated 18th century clothes. So we look forward to seeing you all there, 5 p.m. tomorrow, right here on Facebook Live. Ladies, thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.